Many of us have heard about the 80-20 rule, also known as the Pareto Principle. Right, the rule that says 80% of your outputs come from 20% of your inputs. Yep. And while it has roots in economic studies, we're going to see how it applies to creativity and business ownership. Let's do it. The Speakeasy Podcast, real talk about leadership and sanity in the creative industry. I'm Karen Steffel. And I'm Jen Estel. Managing creativity and business, we probably have an opinion on that. No prohibitions. Clearly, we have cocktails. It's called the Basilico, and as the name implies, it's very basil forward. It is, and you would be forgiven if thinking it was just a pumped-up fuzzy navel because the first two ingredients are vodka and peach schnapps. Remember those days? Yes. But there's way more in it, and you would love it. So it's apple liqueur, simple syrup, lime juice, strawberry, basil leaves. But yes, vodka and peach liqueur is its root. And so it's kind of nice. If um, if you love basil, you're all set here. So really, you can adjust the flavor of this significantly depending upon how much basil you put in. <laughs> it is yummy. It is. And I, I can't, like, I love basil. I do too. So we might be biased in this situation. But what I like about it is here we are in the in the colder months, and I always think of basil as a summer Mm -hmm. flavor, and I'm really quite pleased with it right now in December. Yeah, I'm I'm taking it. I love it. Oh my gosh, the 80-20 rule. I have so many jokes I could make. Well, and it's funny because why would you and I talk about things that are based in economics? Because (laughs) (laughs) not really. Not on our resumes? Not on our resumes. Weird. But, you know, it's the, the principle is really simple. It's named after an t- Italian economist, and, um, and it was, it's from the early 1900s. But he found that, in, that 80% of the land in Italy was owned by 20% of the population. And then he just kind of used that principle to study other things in economics. And right. it, it turns out it kind of it sticks. Kind of, yeah, it's kind of true, true. And, you know, it's a generalization. Sometimes you could go 70-30. Sometimes you could go 10-90 or mm-hmm. whatever. But the truth of the matter is... A small number of inputs generally give you a very great result. Yeah. And it's worth really looking at where that exists in your life. I mean, we could start with financial um, because it does have economic roots. But, you know, let's just say, for example, 20% of your clients may be 80% of your income. That's right. Right. And it's funny because my first instinct on this was like, well, 80% is good enough, so I'm just going to give up after that. I don't need 100%. 80% is pretty darn good. I'm going to give up after 20% of my hours in the week and call it a day. But that, that's not actually how it works. <laughs> it's really not. It's not a law, but it is a principle. And, you know, I think this this whole conversation is about noticing, right? This right. isn't about, like, rules and laws. This is about noticing where this lives in your life and, and being able to um, and really consider how it's at play, yeah. right? And it's funny because I think we both looked at it in terms of creativity and, you know, the math and people have written about this. Say you've got 10 hours for a project. Which piece of effort is the big piece of effort that gets you the big return? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I I think there's times where you could think about it like a term paper or a blog post. You sit down and you start writing the thing, right? And you you stare at the cursor that's blinking at you, but you, you power through and you write the thing. And at the end, how many times have you looked at it and said, this is crap? <laughs> right. And you start over. And that's where, and every every young creative knows this is the case, your first idea might not be your best idea. Right. Um, you need lots of ideas on the table before you pick the one that's great. But you have to understand that that idea generation time is the 20%, yeah. right? Yeah. So you spend that or those early time, those early hours or hour generating all the ideas, vetting them, and then putting your effort into writing about the one idea that was vetted. That is that is what you believe is the best. Right. And that applies to other things, too, I think, in creative. I think it's true with uh, in the design world. You come up with prototypes or... You know, we call them animatics, you sure. know, so that you can kind of poke holes in it and test, right? Yeah. Well, and it's also, I think it applies to a lot of industries. You are a fundraiser and you have a philanthropist who wants to give money. You give them lots of choices about what feels right and then you work out the details. Mm-hmm. You are um, trying to invest your clients' money and you give them lots of options as to where to put it and you spend that time thinking of the choices then find the one that fits. Absolutely. You're creative. You come up with lots of different ideas. 
figure out which one solves the problem the best, and then proceed. And all of the proceed, Mm -hmm. all of the details that come out in the wash is a shit ton of work. I mean, the 80% is a lot of work Mm -hmm. getting the details right, getting the executions done, making sure the paperwork is signed. But it's that early 20% of thinking of all the choices and the options and the what ifs that I think gets you to great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I couldn't have said it better, actually. You know, and I think the 80-20 rule can really help creatives prioritize. So if you've got how often have you been guilty of, and I'm for sure guilty, where you sit down and you're like, you know what, before I really dig in, I'm going to finish these three little things from my to-do list that are just going to be quick. Sure. (laughs) And it's like busy work. And then all of a sudden it's lunch. And you're like, oh, man, I haven't even really dug in for the day. Yeah. So one philosophy of the 80-20 rule when you're looking at prioritizing your creative time or really anybody's time is look at the thing that's hard to accomplish and get that done first because that's going to produce 80% of your productivity or whatever the result is. And then the rest of your little to-dos feel easy to accomplish after that heavy lift, right? Yeah, they do. And it's it's funny because you know if you really bear down on that one important thing – you can get it done in a super timely fashion and probably really get some steam behind you. And somehow all those little things come out in the wash or they become more efficient to handle. It's kind of magical if you get the if you get the big thing out of the way first. So Jen, I have a question before we move on from creative. Do you feel like there's ever a time where the 80-20 rule applies to marketing principles? So is there 20% of my SEO um, investment netting me 80% of my results? Is there 20% of my marketing tactics going to net me 80% of my marketing outcomes? What do you think? I would say the answer to that is kind of yes and no, because absolutely yes, there are very smart tactics that will get you a lot of result until everyone else catches on and everyone is flooding the market with the same tactics that you've used and then the pendulum swings. So you do have to understand the most basic pieces that will get you eyeballs and mind share, right? Mm -hmm. If you are trying to, I mean, it's, it's knowing the right keywords that your users are going to, are going to look for, which are often very different than the keywords that you might use internally. Mm -hmm. So if you are smart about your broad level actions, you can get quite a bit of return. Mm -hmm. The problem that most people have, and I think that this is outside of marketing, this is just all of us we don't want to miss that extra 20%. So then we spend all of this time trying to reach in the corners and look for the magic word that doesn't exist so that we can hopefully catch, capture that last mm-hmm. few minutes or that last few sets of eyeballs. But and, what you said was really smart because you said if you're smart about it. And I think that's true about the 80-20 rule. Sure. You have to be smart about the 20% that you're investing, whether that's time or your financial resources or your, you know, emotional effort <laughs> for for certain things. For sure. And I think it's a place I think you and I talked about it a little bit for entrepreneurs to really think about. Mm-hmm. Like when you are an entrepreneur, you do not have enough time. You do not have enough money. You probably don't have enough capacity in a number of different ways. Right. So finding how that 80-20 rule can work for you mm-hmm. when you're trying to build something new, I think is worth a little bit of thought. I, you know, I absolutely look at my client spread, for example, yeah. and I look at – so the 80-20 rule um, doesn't really apply specifically to my client base. So, so meaning 20% of my clients aren't netting me 20, 80% of my revenue. Mine's a little bit um, more varied than that, but I always look. But So here's where it does apply. If that is true for you or if you have some mix that's similar to that – If you want more of the clients that will net you more of that type of return, then you look at where did you find those clients or are they in the same channel? Are they in the same sector? Why why is it that they were attracted to you? Is it because you're expert in that arena? You know, I work very hard to make sure that no more than 20 percent of my clients are in any one sector so that I have a little bit of diversity like a portfolio. Right. Right. But it's also about what makes the relationship productive. Is it because you have something particular that they need? Is it something about the client relationship and how it functions that makes it quite profitable for you and satisfying for your client, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to understand what makes a productive client so productive. And part of it might be their trust. Part Mm -hmm. of it might be their budgets. Part of it might be 
chemistry between the two of you. You could also look on the other side of that conversation and look at clients who are a drain. So if you know that you've got, you know, a a handful of clients that are incredibly productive for you, um, where your results are really great and then the revenue backs it, then you could also look at what clients are a drain, what clients are costing you money hand over hand over fist with their projects um, and really decide whether they're still um, the right match. In the relationship. That's a really that's a really good piece of advice. And we find ourselves doing that every once in a while and we struggle. And I, I struggle because sometimes I let too much emotion in mm-hmm. and think, oh, yeah, they're not practical and it maybe costs us a lot of money to do this. But they're I, so nice. They're so nice or <laughs> they've been with us for so long. Yeah. Which is not good service for them and it's not effective for us and our growth either. Mm-hmm. Right. So looking at your list and culling it and and not just cull it because you're mathematically taking off the bottom chunk right Mm -hmm. but like understanding what makes someone a productive fit for you and what doesn't make someone a productive fit i think is a really good exercise and the 80 20 rule is a great place to sort of apply that and you look at your top 20 and they could be very disparate right you Mm -hmm. could they could be from different industries that you're serving but what qualities do they have in common What um, similarities do they possess? And then go find more clients with those, and you've won. Great point. Excellent point. You know, I think, too, um, this is a hard one, but, you you know, you could even really analyze your employees as an entrepreneur and see if 20% of your employees are doing 80% of the work. That's a hard, that's a hard one. That's a super hard one. And I think, I think that the bigger your organization gets, the easier that gets. We were mm-hmm. just having a conversation earlier about how some very business decisions become quite emotional when you're in a small organization. Mm-hmm. And so I really struggle with that. And in an industry where we have some employees who are 100%, bill- not 100% billable, but exceptionally billable, and then other employees who are in a support position, how do you make that apply? Right. No, you're right. But I mean, it if, again, at the very top, we talked about how this isn't a law, right? This is about, this is a conversation about noticing. So it may or may not apply to you, but it's just a way about looking. Is it, can you use the 80-20 rule to really notice operational things in your organization that you haven't been able to really view from that point of view before? And hearing you talk about it makes me think I could use it on my own self-reflection what things do I get done in that 20% that are really valuable and what other places am I spinning my wheels and not creating a lot of results? Those things should probably come off my plate in one form or the other. And so it's a good place for self-reflection to understand just where you can be more efficient with your time or have more free time, right? Absolutely. Or if there are things at work that you're doing, maybe you're spinning your wheels on it. Maybe it's not producing any results. So that's that extra little 20% that's producing no result for it. You're not getting that extra juice out right. of the squeeze. So maybe you just turn your back on it. So what you're really saying here is that it is a good tool to use to do some solid reflection in your day-to-day life to mm-hmm. see where you're being effective and where you're not being effective. Absolutely. Or where your organization is being effective or not effective. Can you forecast what 20% actually matters, though? This is the part that I thought was really interesting. Um, I found this topic interesting in in terms of not only the office, but family and mental health and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And could I, if I were asked to, figure out, well, of all of my effort, what 20% is the one that really gives me the big bang? Mm Mm-hmm. I know. I remember you guys took a vacation a couple years ago, and you had to give up something for one of your kids so that the whole family could go on this bigger vacation, and you struggled with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you have a family, you are always giving up one thing for another. That's just negotiation. (laughs) No. But I did have a um, funny—Spencer wrote a poem about himself, and it was up in his classroom when we went to parent-teacher conferences, and he he noted how much— He loved going to Mackinac Island and how he wishes he could go back. And in my head, I was like, but you went to Italy and Greece. (laughs) And so the funny thing when you think of the 80-20 principle is 80% of the effort and time and money went to sending him to Italy and Greece. (laughs) And no time and effort went into Mackinac Island because it's right here. But the thing he remembers and the thing that he thought was part of something he wanted to share with his class was the thing that was very little effort. And so I found it funny to think of the 80-20 principle in terms of 
how it affects our kids and what 20% are they going to remember and is going to be meaningful. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if you can guess because I wouldn't have guessed that beforehand, but it was very enlightening to see it from his his point of view. So maybe those special one-on-one moments that cost you no money and really no thinking, you just maybe crawl into bed and cuddle for a few minutes and have a conversation might produce 80% of the extra love Yeah, (laughs) compared to like, Something like the birthday party that you put all of your heart and soul in, into right. creating and that, it's, that kind of half killed you. Yeah. And it's for us, the thing that I think is going to produce 80% of the result or the good memories for our kids is just showing up. Yeah. It's not the big birthday party. Right. It's the it's the small moments when you're there. Mm-hmm. I know for us that right now I I can see in a very short bit of time that our family meals together are going to slip a little bit, right, because of kid activities. But for now, I know that the 20% of the time that I put into menu planning every Saturday or Sunday morning, I know exactly what's going to happen Sunday through Thursday. And I make those meals happen. And I make sure I shop for them and I prep for them throughout the week. I know that that gives me this 80% on the other hand that I get this extra time because our evenings are so short between coming home from work and having bedtime because my kids are younger than yours. And so I try to maximize that time with them where during that time I'm not crazy and stressed out and just trying to figure out dinner. You know, like that's already done so I can just be present. And so that's one of the things that I try to build in because I know that that's not going to be – available all the time with kid activities. But you're right. I I don't have a way of predicting if that's something that they'll look back on and decide that it mattered. But what we realized with both of those examples are for you, um, planning and being ready so that life isn't so stressful and filled with indecision Mm -hmm. is giving you the time to to have the family life you want. Yeah. And for me, realizing that the small moments and the small things might matter more than the big produced things makes me make a few better choices in the long run. So Mm -hmm. looking at that, what 20% will matter can really help you predict and be more effective both at home and at work. I don't know. Mental health, though. What's the 20% that that keeps keeps you mentally sane? You know, a little bit of working out, moving my body. And so we've talked about this before. You and I both love a hike in the woods. Um, That's incredibly clarifying for me, but sometimes just good old-fashioned sweat. I like to ride the bike. Mm -hmm. It's pretty fair. And so even if I don't have an hour to work out or 45 minutes to work out, like this morning, I knew that 15 minutes was way – 15 minutes of really hard sweat was way better than not doing it at all because I knew I needed – I needed my brain cleared for the day. Yeah. So making that kind of space, even even in a small way, Mm -hmm. gives you a day full of peace and logic. Yeah. And that's that's worth way more than 80%. (laughs) And you did it in only 15 minutes. Yeah. (laughs) We had a crazy weekend a couple weekends ago, just mayhem and everyone going in 12 different directions. And I looked at everybody and I said, I'm going to go kayaking. (laughs) And I pulled a kayak down, I threw it in the river, and I was gone for an hour and a half all by myself. But it was worth it. Yeah. That 20% was worth all the undone chores, for sure. Yeah. Mental health is not to be messed with, for no. sure. The moral of the story, kids, is that this 80-20 rule can be exceptionally useful, and it's a good analytical tool in your day-to-day business life. Mm-hmm. And it's a really good tool for keeping you grounded in your personal life as well. Yeah. I almost, I'm picturing it like, um, you know, the scales that you, you put, uh, you know, the weight on one side and yeah. then you put the product on the other. I think of like at the peanut shop, yeah. right? It's actually like when 80 and 20 are actually in balance <laughs> instead of 50-50. Right. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? I don't know. So, yes, listeners, I would like to see um, where you can apply the 80-20 rule, whether it's in planning and concept development or managing your time or keeping your family sane. And I want to know if people could find some spare time in their life, which we just talked about that the last time. We can't find, we make time, we don't find it. Mm -hmm. But this could maybe be a tool. Yeah. So tell us, tell us how it goes. Tell us how your 80-20 is going. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Easy Underground or on our website, thespeakeasypodcast.com. 
Jen, what are we talking about next time? Oh my goodness, I'm excited about this one. We are both surrounded by highly effective and successful people. That's true. And we know that they all have a fair amount in common, albeit they're very different. That's true. It certainly isn't where they came from or what their job description looks like. Nope, it really comes from their mindset and their habits. So next time we're talking about the most important and sometimes hard things we do each year. And that's what we're talking about next time. So join us. That's how we're wrapping up the year, guys. 